action or contemplation, service or worship, hospitality or prayer. For as long as the church has existed, we have debated these dichotomies. Which is more important, kneeling at the altar or mopping the church floors? What should we prioritize? How should we find a good balance between the mystical and the practical? In this week's gospel story, Jesus enters a certain village, and a woman named Martha welcomes him into her home. As soon as Jesus, and presumably his disciples, enter the house, Martha launches into the practical work of hospitality, cleaning, organizing, cooking, and serving. Her sister Mary, meanwhile, sits at Jesus' feet, taking in every word he says and paying no attention to her harried sister. We have no idea how long Martha's patience holds, but I'm guessing she spends a good hour or two in the kitchen simmering before her frustration finally boils over. When it does, she marches into the dining room and confronts Jesus. Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But Jesus doesn't do as he's told. He neither scolds nor redirects Mary. Instead, he redirects Martha. You are worried and distracted by many things, he tells her. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, and it will not be taken away from her. This is such a brief and seemingly simple gospel story, and yet it raises so many questions. I'll admit at the outset that it leaves me conflicted. So let's begin by naming the unease that perhaps many of us share. I grew up in a traditional South Asian community that placed a supremely high value on hospitality. I also grew up in an ethnic and religious context where women's work carried less value than men's. Some of my earliest and most vivid memories involved sari-clad women, my mom, my aunts, and dozens of other church ladies hovering over tables laden with fragrant, delicious dishes, refilling a cup of chai here, offering a second helping of rice and chicken curry there, mopping up a coffee spill somewhere else, while the men talked, studied, debated, relaxed, and feasted. Whether the occasion was a home Bible study, a Sunday evening potluck, or the all-church Christmas party, the women prepped, cooked, served, and cleaned to make the gathering festive, and fun for all. They did so with a strong sense of dignity and pride. This was the work they had been raised to do. It was the work that cemented their identities as good women of God. But as a little girl, I figured out pretty quickly that what counted as spiritual work was the work the men did, the work of preaching, studying scripture, or presiding over communion. To be fair, I don't think this was because the men in my community were bad people, I think it was because the patriarchal culture that raised them made sure they never experienced the inside of a kitchen, a pantry, a clothes dryer, or a bottle of pine salt. They literally never saw the work that robust hospitality requires. This is some of the baggage I bring to Martha and Mary's story, which might explain why, when I read Jesus' words to Martha, my first response is irritation and my second is disappointment. Yes, Jesus elevated the status of women by affirming Mary's right to discipleship. Traditionally, only male disciples sat at their teacher's feet to study the Torah. This gender reversal is a huge deal, and I do not take it for granted. And yet, I wish Jesus had done more. I wish he'd rounded up his male disciples, ushered them into the kitchen, and directed them to bake the bread, fry the fish, and chop the vegetables, perhaps while Martha took a much-needed nap. I wish he'd put each one of the boys to work and then said, Oh, in case you're wondering, this domestic stuff isn't a prelude to the sacred. This stuff is the sacred. Perhaps I sound nitpicky, but I begin with unease for a good reason. If Jesus had taken a more radical stance in Martha's house, if he had said even a word or two to challenge the gender division of labor he encountered in his lifetime, Would his followers have wasted the next 2,000 years arguing over a woman's rightful place in the home or in the church? 
Would Christian women today still feel self-conscious, judged and shamed over how well they do or don't juggle the competing demands of their domestic, professional, and religious lives? Maybe, but maybe not. Don't get me wrong, I do believe that Jesus championed women in a thousand essential ways during his time on earth. But the fact remains that in this particular story, Martha's burdensome sense of obligation and duty had cultural roots which Jesus did not confront on her behalf. Her anxiety didn't come from nowhere. She lived inside a social and religious system that fully expected her to behave as she did. And the power of that system was formidable. In other words, Martha needed systemic change in order to live into the permission Jesus wanted to offer her. She couldn't embrace such radical freedom by herself. She needed the folks with power to embrace it with her and for her. So I wonder, what would it be like for us contemporary Christians to examine the systems and structures that still bind people like Martha today? What would it cost us to dismantle those systems? What would it look like to create concrete opportunities for today's Marthas to rest, to sit freely at Jesus' feet, to find support, community, and help as they struggle to become disciples? What would it look like to stand in solidarity with your nearest Martha as she unlearns a lifetime's worth of messaging about what makes her soul lovable, valuable, honorable, and holy? Okay, let's move on from ambivalence to something more positive. Part of what I love and appreciate about this gospel story is its surprising radicalness. As in, wait a minute, Jesus, are you saying you want us to be unbalanced? I'm asking because we live in the real world and know that for all practical purposes, it's ridiculous to champion contemplation over action, word over deed, the mystic over the activist. Why? because we need both. Our common life requires both. How would the church survive without Martha? Martha who bakes the Eucharistic bread, Martha who tends the grounds, Martha who arranges the flowers, restocks the votive candles, sews the pageant costumes, and dusts the pews. After all, isn't it telling that in this story, Mary and Martha were sisters? Their differences could not erase the basic fact that they belonged together. They needed each other. They held each other in balance, right? Or is that not right? The truth is I have tried and tried to read Mary and Martha's story as a story about balance, but I don't think Jesus's ringing endorsement of Mary's choosing the better part will allow me to get away with that tepid reading. Because this story is not about balance. This story is about choosing the one thing, the best thing, and forsaking everything else for its sake. The story is about single-mindedness, about a passionate and undistracted pursuit of a single, mind-blowing treasure. Think of Jesus' most evocative parables. They all point in this same direction. The pearl of great price, the buried treasure in the field, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. Christianity, it seems, is not about balance. It's about extravagance. It's not about being reasonable. It's about being wildly, madly, and deeply in love with Jesus. As soon as Jesus entered Martha's house, he turned the place upside down. He messed with Martha's expectations, routines, and habits. He insisted on costly change. Perhaps Martha's mistake was that she assumed she could invite Jesus into her life and still carry on with that life as usual maintaining control, privileging her own priorities, and clinging to her much-beloved agendas and schedules. What was Jesus' response to that assumption? No, absolutely not. That is not how discipleship works. In contrast, Mary recognized that Jesus' presence in her house required a radical, countercultural shift, which is to say a wholehearted surrender. Every action, every decision, every priority, and every life choice would have to be filtered through this new love, this new devotion, this new passion. Why? Because Jesus was no ordinary guest. He was the guest who would be host. The host who would provide the bread of life, the living water and the wine that was his own blood, to anyone who would sit at his feet 
and receive his hospitality. It's easy to lose sight of Mary. In our work-frenzied, performance-driven lives, it's easy to believe that pondering, listening, waiting, and resting have no value. In our age of snark and cynicism, it's easy to roll our eyes at spiritual earnestness. In a world that is so profoundly broken, it's easy to argue that we should leave contemplation to the monastics and throw all of our time and energy into social engagement. To be clear, we are called to work for justice. We are called to bring liberty to the oppressed and comfort to the afflicted. But every work we do must begin, Jesus insists, from only one thing. It must begin with him. It must begin at his feet. I find it helpful here to remember that Jesus didn't call Martha out for her hospitality. It was not her cooking, cleaning, or serving that bothered him. The actual problem he named was a spiritual one. Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. The root meaning of the word worry is strangle or seize by the throat and tear. The root meaning of the word distraction is a separation or dragging apart of something that should be whole. These are violent words, words that wound and fracture, states of mind that render us incoherent, divided, and unwhole. Jesus found Martha in just such a state of fragmentation, a condition in which she could not enjoy his company, savor his presence, find inspiration in her work, receive anything he wished to offer her, or show him genuine love. Instead, all she could do was question his love, Lord, do you not care? Fixate on herself, my sister has left me to do all the work by myself, and triangulate, tell her then to help me. Does any of this sound familiar? Is your service or your hospitality rooted in an anxious perfectionism that strangles you? Is your inner life so fragmented, so incoherent that you struggle to give and receive love? Are you quick to seethe? Has your busyness become an affront to the people you wish to host? Is your worry keeping you from being present, engaged, and fully alive? Have you lost the ability to attend, to linger, to delve deep into the relationship Jesus longs to have with you? Are you using your packed schedule to avoid intimacy with God or with others? If I'm honest, my answer to many of these questions is yes. If yours is yes too, then I wonder if we can hear Jesus' words to Martha, not as a criticism, but as an invitation, not as a rebuke, but as a soothing balm. Jesus knows that we ache to be whole. Jesus knows that we place devastating expectations on ourselves. Jesus knows that our resentments, like Martha's, are often born of fear and envy. Martha longed to sit where Mary sat. She longed to take delight in Jesus' words. She longed to surrender her heavy burden and allow Jesus to host her. Maybe we long for these beautiful things too. If so, here is the good news. There is need of only one thing. And if we choose it, no one will ever have the power to take it away. So let's choose it. Let's learn a hospitality grounded in love, not fear. Let's begin where God's Spirit invites us to begin, at the feet of the one who comes to serve, in the presence of the one who values our rest. Jesus, our host, is waiting.